All right, I'm back. Um, I'm trying to launch the uh, introduction video of uh, Cut, but the video doesn't pop up. I don't know what happens. I think it's the, the uh, night effect. Uh, so it's the only video that doesn't, doesn't go there. So it's, instead of that, I will put, place a small commercial just for, for fun. So that's, that's a small... Uh, Introducing Pack, the deodorant for men. Pack, it is now laid from hard reflection. Pack, the refreshment of smart automated performance engineering. Pack cotton, pack shamani, pack of the future. The rest is up to you. All right, so that was a small break. <laughs> Just a hard Love bit. It. <laughs> so. Um, so 9.45, it's the beer time. For those who are uh, not already at the beer time, it's already beer time uh, in uh, Europe. Uh, so uh, I, uh, I was trying to get uh, Scott uh, uh, talking last year, uh, during the first PAX Scotland, but uh, Scott is a really, really busy. Uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, you all must know or well, I heard about Scott more, um, and uh, and then uh, he uh, we he uh, he suggested a presentation, and uh, the topic that he suggested uh, I really loved it. Uh, he was wanted to make some uh, comparison between the different HTTP protocols. So if you know the HTTP protocol, it should be uh, 1.1, then HTTP 2. Uh, so HTTP 2 has changed a bit, you know, it's start to be implemented a, a, a bit. The first, uh, we did some some comparison between HTTP 2 and HTTP 1.1. I think there is some advantage and disadvantage. And uh, then uh, Google uh, introduced the Quick Protocol. So uh, the Quick Protocol, on the paper, it seems quite promising. So uh, then I had uh, some doubts about uh, the usage of UDP, and uh, and I'm pretty excited to uh, to uh, get the, the results and uh, and share the. the all the work that Scott has been implemented. So he's been working hard to implement this. So uh, first of all, I would just a uh, uh, good job, to Scott, because uh, you didn't take a topic and, and just deliver a basic presentation. You did a, you put a lot of effort behind that. So that's that's pretty awesome. Otherwise, should I introduce Scott? I don't know, uh, but uh, I mean, you should be aware of Scott. I mean, he's been there uh, since when I started Ponsonier, or, or, or I heard about the name, uh, I always know that he uh, did a lot of great stuff uh, with a uh, load runner and uh, a lot of different tools. But uh, he, uh, I had the chance to meet him uh, two or three years ago, and uh, I'm uh, super excited uh, to collaborate with Scott. He's a great performance engineer. He has a great uh, methods, and I think he uh, he has uh, he is helping a lot of organization on implementing the right method and the right approach for for testing. So uh, without waiting anymore, uh, just uh, also a small uh, note, uh, Scott uh, founded a, a company called C Simple APM, the next generation uh, of APM for traffic on Citrix and other apps. So it's a uh, product that uh, seems very promising, uh, but uh, yeah, I will leave Scott to explain uh, the story. But I think it's, uh, it's uh, Scott is uh, he's not afraid of putting investment and effort on a lot of topics, so it's, it's a really Awesome speaker to have today, so it's an honor to have you on board on this virtual pack. So um, I uh, will finish this uh, presentation. I'll leave the rest to you. And yeah, that, wow. Make After that, time. it's like okay. Thank you very much. Goodbye. <laughs> so the only thing I need to know is if I'm a speaker, how to share my screen because I don't see that option here. So there is on the right side, if you're using the web extension, there's on the right side, there is a sharing option. There's an icon with sharing option. And you have two options, share videos, or the other one is share your screen. I do have sharing options, and I'm going to be sharing my screen.
Okay. Sorry about that. I thought I already had that working. Can you see my screen? Not yet. Okay. It says that you can. Try it again. Can you see my screen now? Uh, yes, I can. Okay, thank you. Um, man, hearing that introduction, I'm, I'm thinking Iron Maiden's about to come out and play or something. So I gotta, I gotta really live up to this. And I've got a short period of time to do this. Um, so guys, the first thing I have to do, uh, if I'm sharing my screen, is I have to establish myself as a true performance engineer. In order to do that, I have to tell you where to find the best barbecue in the United States. And that would be Dreamland Barbecue which you can see right here. I do not own the restaurant, but it is found in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. And this is the original location right next to the city landfill. So make sure you stop in there and get some great barbecue. All right, with that, I think I've established myself and my credibility. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and present. To say that this was a little bit of a too ambitious effort for me to try to complete uh, for this small amount of time would be an understatement. So I want to apologize to everybody. I'm going to be going really, really fast. We are going to geek out a little bit, but I, I think you'll enjoy it. And here's my promise to you. Uh, there's a lot of things that I'm going to have to go through very fast, but I will be posting uh, multiple blogs that as I worked on this 21 days in a row without a break uh, to build this for you, I made probably about 80 to 90 pages of notes, and I'm condensing those down into blogs, so you'll have a lot of the details. And I will try to answer as many questions as I can today. Obviously, we won't get to everything, but I will make sure that that gets posted and you will be fully informed. Today, what I'm going to try to do as fast as I can is break down what the heck is HTTP3 and what is quick. I just got over talking about HTTP2, and we have, you know, your organization might not even be um, using it yet. So what is it? I'm going to try to break it down to you in a, in a way that even I, a kindergartner level brain, could understand and talk about the challenges with trying to actually do a performance test today. That's what I was trying to do with this experiment. I'm going to show you a demo of what I tried to, to do with the tools I had today and what kind of results and findings that I had. And then I'll, I'll take your questions and hopefully um, that it, this will all come together and make sense. But picture that I am Doc Brown coming out of the DeLorean and telling you I'm from the future and this is the stuff that you're going to be testing and working on for the next you know, two to five years. It's going to be a very gradual change, but it is coming and I just wanted to make sure everybody was aware about it. What it, aware of it. I didn't want to just do a presentation based on research. I always promised my uh, people who come to my presentations, I've actually gotten my hands dirty and I've actually done it. So that's what I've done here. So first, let's start talking about this. What is this thing called QUIC? It stands for Quick UDP Internet Connections. And for those of you who understand the OSI model, the first thing that's hitting you in the face is the U, the UDP. Hang on just a second. I know the difference between TCP and UDP, right? TCP, conversation, acknowledgement, negotiation, that kind of thing, prioritization. UDP, fire and forget. That's why we use it for video streaming, right? Because it doesn't matter if a packet gets lost. We'll fix it in the mix, right? What happens when somebody like Google, who has very smart people decide, you know what, let's try to push something that's traditionally been going over TCP over to UDP and why they think that's such a good idea. So if that's not raising your eyebrows already, um, keep listening. So how did we get here? You probably, remember if you followed any of my blogs back in 2016 i started talking about how wonderful http2 and you'll hear me say h2 h3 same thing i talked about h2 and how it was great for performance engineers because it was trying to make things faster and in many cases it did and the adoption rate since people like me have started talking about it late 15 through 2016 we started seeing more adoption of the protocol in, in the web space uh, hasn't been as much as I actually thought. I thought it was going to be a, a bigger curve, um, but it, it didn't turn out that way because as people began to roll it out, they had to make development changes and adopt different ways of handling 
re, you know, request and resources on a web server, and that takes time to convert over. Uh, many people just put an H2 proxy in front of an existing 1.1 site and got the benefits of turning it into a binary stream and getting you know the, the benefits of H2 out of the box, like uh, compression on all the headers to reduce that you know overhead and, and reduce the amount of traffic you need to push across the network, which is great. But um, when they began to implement it in some cases, especially when there's high latency and dropped packets, um, reordering, things of that nature, it actually became slower for some people. So some people began to back out of that. So in some cases, uh, 1.1 was faster. And so people started stepping back and saying, hang on just a second, we weren't ready for that. So let's back up just a little bit more. 2014, Google begins to take HTTP2 and says, hmm, what would happen if we took that traffic and moved over to UDP get it out of TCP and, and not worry about that slow start and figure out, you know, can we make that faster and we'll call it quick. Now that's where it originated from. And then they turned that over to the Internet Engineering Task Force, which is a group of smart people that's way smarter than, than me who determine what protocols we're gonna use in the future apparently. And they formed a working group for that. And they started developing, uh, uh, the, the the basics for an IETF version. And as they began to move forward with that, they realized that you know Google, as it was implementing it, uh, especially on YouTube is where you would see it a lot because that's obviously on, on UDP, um, they were seeing good gains on their performance. I mean, faster speed. Um, they saw the most benefit in countries where a lot of bandwidth is very restricted. So that helped them as a global company. But when the IETF began to take it over, they said, hold on a second, if we're really gonna do this, there are other issues that need to be solved at the same time. So why don't we take quick and turn it into a real transport protocol and let's start solving things like authentication and security at the same time that we're fixing some of these other things. So if you were, I'm gonna go into it in more detail here, but if you recall, HTH2 takes you to from a lot of different connections, like six to eight connections on a browser to one, quote unquote, very fast connection. And there are multiple streams in that connection. And it uh, that stream internally, it handles that prioritization. And the goal is, can we remove head of line blocking, right? So when we introduced that latency and the network problems, we found that that didn't necessarily uh, fix the head of line blocking, what it actually did was it moved that blocking down a layer. So I'll get into that in just a second, but that's that's the key here. And that's what the IETF wanted to solve as well. So in November of last year, uh, the web browser, or I'm sorry, the web server maker Lightspeed and Facebook got together at a hackathon at a conference where the IETF was meeting and they were able to hack out some initial code that let the Lightspeed web server take on request. It wasn't from a browser, but it was it's probably from a modified fork of curl or something of that nature. And they were able to get it to talk with the, the latest IETF spec they were working on at that time. The very next day, as they were looking at these test results and they were talking about the results of the hackathon, somebody stood up and there's actually a YouTube video where the guy actually stands up and says, hey, I think we should call this HTTP3 because if we're gonna do this, let's do this right and let's address all the shortcomings that were found with H2 and put it into quick and, uh, and and deal with it that way. So, and everybody agreed. So that was when they changed it. The first time I ever heard of uh, something really being deployed um, in a you know massive way publicly was this past April. You may recall April 1st, Cloudflare released their own Warp VPN. Uh, some people refer to it as 1.1.1.1, like people use it on their mobile phones. Um, that's actually based on the current quick draft or what was current at that time. In July, the draft for the working group expired and I think they've actually went past the expiration date, but now we are beginning to see in just the past couple of months, people are starting to fork over the source code for the original Chromium browser, put in custom libraries and trying to make browsers work. Um, Daniel Stenberg is the maker of curl. Uh, just uh, September the 11th, he released a new version of curl that supports the experimental version of H3. 
Uh, and Genix just had a conference. I believe they announced their um, intention to support it as well. Lightspeed is the one who has supported it from the beginning since that hackathon, and they've continued to develop it. So they're farther ahead than others. And Google Chrome just last week announced that the Canary version of Chrome uh, has a flag that you can turn on and you can start testing this with the Chrome browser, which is great because now, hey, I've got a browser. Now I can actually do some real, you know, performance testing and some rendering in that as well. So that's how we got here. So you're hearing about this stuff on the cutting edge as it's coming out today. Um, so let's back up and talk about that head of line blocking real quick and we'll, we'll get from one to three. In HTTP version one, we would have to open up multiple TCP IP connections and talk from the client to the server. And many times larger resources would block smaller resources. So over the past 20 years, 20 plus years, developers have been coming up with every kind of angle to overcome that blocking issue to make websites faster and, and pull up and render the page faster. When H2 came out, the, the attempt was let's make one connection over TLS and let's make it really fast and let's put some prioritization in there so that all these things can run parallel and these larger resources will not block the smaller ones. It also means that the developers, instead of having 50.js files and 20 CSS files, they need to really combine them together and minify them. And then uh, that that's different. They're actually trying to, uh, I'm sorry, they, they needed to keep them separate because that's what they were doing before. They were trying to minify and, and push these things together so that it was just one request. So the fewer requests, the better. With H2, it doesn't matter. And a lot of smaller requests are actually better for H2. So that was a, it was a little bit of a change for developers to have to do that. Um, the other thing you get from H2 is it is binary instead of text. So that in of itself is a speed benefit. And two, you get header compression, which means there's a lot less stuff that has to go back and forth across the wire. And it saves you in that respect. With H3 now, we introduce uh, TLS 1.3, which has the capability of a, a zero round trip. If you've actually connected to that server before and it still knows who you are and it still trusts you, it doesn't have to make all these back and forth requests like it used to every time. So even the very first time, it's reduced the number of round trips. So just think about this. If you go from two round trips on H2, when you're in, on a secure site and all H2 sites and beyond are gonna be forced to be H2 for, for lack of a better term, that's what you're gonna to have to do because all browsers are gonna make you do that. If you go from two round trips to one round trip, right there, you've reduced your encryption latency by 50%. Okay, as a performance engineer in me, I'm like, okay, yes, as long as it's still as secure. And that's part of the problem that they were fixing. So I know what you're thinking. Scott, you just told us that by taking this one connection with all these streams, that was supposed to fix the problem, right? It's all these binary streams, it's supposed to be faster. Like I said, the the issue is it's great on a, a pristine LAN network inside of a lab, which is where most of the people test this stuff, right? So when you put it out in the real world and you put it on a really crappy 3G connection or satellite connection out in some farm somewhere, um, it's not as good, and in some cases it is worse. So what they ended up doing is seeing that those head of line blocking issues went from the HTTP level down into the TCP level. And TCP is not something you're gonna be able to easily change, it's the nature of TCP and how that it works. And that is what QUIC is trying to solve. So here is from the left to the right, going from a 2016 H2 website with TLS 1.2 and more round trips at the security level. Moving over to the right, we see an H3 site with TLS 1.3, so we reduce that round trip. And notice that the quick layer is a fatter layer than, uh, it kind of matches TCP's layer, but UDP is a very slender layer. What, what they've really done is taken all of the stuff that TCP does with negotiation, acknowledgement, prioritization, and they've moved it up into quick. And I guess they're probably thinking we're going to do it better than we did last time, than the, than the people before us, generations before us that did TCP. And there's different versions of TCP out there. And some of them uh, are more are buggier than others. And out of all of this time, you would think we would have a great standard in TCP. In some cases, it's better than others, but 
for the most part, no, it's, there's still problems, right? So they're trying to solve that problem by moving a lot of that logic up into quick. And where, whereas this bottom layer, it, the internet protocol IP really just kind of sits there on a TCP IP NAC. I mean, I, I mean you get a, an IP address, right? And it's like, who cares about IP? It's TCP that's doing all the cool stuff and, and up. In this case, UDP is sort of like a bump on a log too. It's just providing the transport back and forth. It's the port and the transport that's going, that's taking the traffic. Quick is really doing all the work for you. And um, be, because of that, it can be good when it eventually gets there, but is it there now? Not really. That's why it's still, you know, just getting out of draft form. Um, with H3 also comes a new logging standard that they're trying, people are trying to fight for right now. It's called QLog and it's a JSON format output. And what you see on this slide is a visualization that um, Robin Marks put together. There's a, a Python tool he wrote. Uh, there's a website I'm going to share with you. It's in, it's either going to be in the references. There's a lot of references in the slide deck for you and a lot of speaker notes uh, with references and links. But this is a visual, visualization from left to right of all of those in, internal streams that are going across quick, how much time they spent on each hop, uh, where they fit on the prioritization level. So you can kind of see how the protocol is handling that traffic. That is a, if you build an H3 site, you can point this uh, web server at that site and send it a, a page and it will give you this kind of output. So it, this is still being standardized, but I think uh, starting out with a JSON format is a really good start. And that's kind of the way the world is talking these days. If I can parse something in JSON, I can build a graph. It's just it's just that easy. So that's kind of where we're at. And that's a technical breakdown of the protocol thus far. But as with anything in life, just like Biff, there are challenges. And the challenges right now that we're facing is lack of support. As you can imagine, we're still looking at draft code. So they're still testing that. So it would be really hard to try to performance test that or even think about doing anything in production. This would all be experimental at this point. There are very few web server options. And up until, uh, unless you wanted to create your own uh, fork of Chromium, uh, until last week, you couldn't get a real browser that supported it as well. Curled it was, it will somewhat support it, but that's not what you really want. You want a browser. Caddy server is like one of those, you know, Bill and Bob and two of their cousins use it. It's brand new. Nobody knows about it, but, uh, they do support it and they're coming on. You can look them up on GitHub. Lightspeed though. Lightspeed is the most advanced. Uh, it's not open Lightspeed. So there's a open version, open source version that is free. Um, this is the paid version. So, there, you know, you have to, to get uh, true quick support and uh, H2 over quick and all of that draft. You have to buy uh, the license. It's it's a whopping ten dollars a month. So don't let anybody panic. Um, I think you'll get by. Uh, just give up a couple of, you know, hamburgers or something a, a month. Uh, Lightspeed is actually I is part of the biggest portion of notes that I had to create because I had to really learn Lightspeed and its uh, idiosyncrasies. Like, you know, hey, if you turn on UDP port 443 and then you say, I don't want to use that anymore, but I'm not going to shut the port down, it still sends quick requests. So there's there's still bugs in that as well. And I, I again, I will share all of that stuff on the blog. But so I had to use Lightspeed if I wanted to to test this. The other thing is just right now, 5%, about 5% of quick connections just fail right off the bat. So it's still really buggy. Um, and Google is saying that they have seen a need for twice as many resources, not necessarily just CPU, it could be RAM, but they're saying they need about 2x the resources to do about the same amount of work. I think that's probably because it's got a lot of debug code in it, uh, and that will probably come down over time. Uh, the security guys aren't happy about this at all because typically port 443 is going to be blocked for UDP and they don't like it. And because there's very few that even know about this yet, the hackers will see a UDP port that's open and they'll try to go for something. And so there's there's a kind of an inner war going on with security to even open up that traffic right now. And also think about this. You know, we've used TCP IP so long on the web. Think of all the embedded TCP code that's inside of routers and switches and, and NIC cards and all of that stuff. You know, this is not something where you're going to be able to flip a switch and then everybody's using UDP. 
And because of that, UDP really hasn't been tested as hard as TCP has just because of usage. Uh, then you throw on top of that that there's no real API where everybody can agree on, of course, and there's always Microsoft to deal with, which they're getting better, but there, there are multiple libraries that do support it in their own way. I had to stick with Lightspeed's implementation to make my website work, but I'm going to show you a slide here in a moment where you can see there, there are other implementations. So tools, what are you going to use to test this thing with? How are you going to performance test it with today's tool? Uh, you can write something your own. Uh, you can, uh, you know, fork your own browser code and do it with, you know, any kind of browser testing tool. Um, I'm going to tell you how I did it. it. May not be the best way, but this is what I had to do. So I started using curl on the tr the traditional calls because curl will give you some metrics, and I've got some specific curl calls that I can share with you guys that'll show you the metrics you can get back. Then I've got web analytics that I can, I can look at the actual log files from the web server, how, how long does light speed say that that takes? And I realize that's not browser rendering. I also use this Qlog tool and mainly, you know, it's opening up what Google Chrome would support at the time and looking at the dev tools and the network tab uh, and the performance tab and seeing uh, the transport protocols that were actually being sent. Um, I used Apposite Technologies Netrobeat product. Now, this I got to I got to give these guys a, a plug because number one, I reached out to them and I said the problem that I've seen in the past is these this head of line blocking uh, is introduced with low latency and when there's network problems, I need a network emulation tool uh, or virtualization tool to create a really cruddy couple of profiles and I need to do it really fast. Can you guys help me? They helped me. And I was, uh, I was amazed at how fast I was able to get up and running with this tool. This was a beta version of the product. They put a, uh, an AMI, um, it's a machine out on AWS that you can just, you, put, you, oh, you subscribe to it, you get a license, you open it up, and then you just point your uh, DNS server to that, and then it just forwards on the traffic. So it puts you between your DNS server, say Cloudflare, and your web server, and it hits them first, you build a, a profile, change the profile, and you're using that different um, network connection. So I was, I created a couple of really poor connections and compared that in the, in, to the lab version. Um, so that was probably the most important piece to have to try to prove out my theory of, does this head of line of blocking go away with quick, at least what we have now. I've got Node and Puppeteer in there with question marks because this is something I tried, but you know, Puppeteer really is a headless version of Chrome, and Node is just the JavaScript that tells that what to do. And right now, it was just too difficult to try to create my own uh, light speed enabled version of Chrome uh, for the, that API library, and I just ran out of time to tell you the truth. I would have loved to have done it, but now that Chrome does support it with Canary, you just turn on those options, and now you've got Node and Puppeteer that you can use to send off some requests and, and pull timings out through that JavaScript code. And of course, it wouldn't be complete without being able to drive the load, and I was driving the Chrome version that did support uh, the, the quick over HTTP2 um, with Lightspeed, um, I was able to do that with NeoLoad. So I had to get a little creative with that, and thanks, Henrik, for all the help that you provided me. Uh, I will hopefully be able to share this project as, uh, as a project file on the site as well, where you could download it and import it in NeoLoad, and you'll be able to see all the results and the scripts and all the stuff that I did. So that's what I put together, and uh, here's, the, here's the quick implementations that I could have used instead of Lightspeed, if I had that on a, a web server, um, notice that both Cloudflare, who has a Rust API, and Google, who just came out with theirs, are all, they're both naming their implementation Quiche. And I said, because naming is hard. Apparently, that's, that's a big deal. Uh, so there are various versions of Quick that you can use, and there is a link to GitHub where you can see as new ones become available. All right, so let's get to the test results. Uh, one, one more slide here. This is my test lab, okay? So I hope you can see this if you blow it up enough on your screen. If not, um, it, it'll be provided at the end of this. I'm sure they'll, they'll have a way for you to look at it. But if you blow it up from the top down, the top is I got an instance of a, a, a web WordPress site, uh, 
implemented that and I had a separate database. It's not all on the same machine, but it's an AWS Ubuntu 1804 instance. Um, it's got Lightspeed. I installed the Lightspeed web server on it. Now in front of that, that middle tier is I pushed it through Apposite. I didn't do that for every test, but I, I did it without Apposite and then I did it with the Apposite profiles, uh, Netropy, I should say, profiles. And then in front of that is a bunch of Google browsers that NeoLoad is pushing. And then as you get to the bottom, that's being pushed from, you know, Neo, a NeoLoad uh, load generator, which I just had a Windows server to a 20, 2016 server to use. And to the right hand side was Node and Puppeteer as an as an extra experiment. And eventually that will be part of my lab as well starting this week. Um, so my mission was. I can't just run a test um, that just calls a single page. I want to try to do this more realistically, and I want to do it on an actual site. So I created this site called a, uh, loadtesthttp3.com. So hopefully you can see this. And this is live. It's on the web. You can go to it right now. Um, it's just got a few pages on it. I wanted to have uh, – I used a real WordPress template. There are a couple of real blogs out here that is part of the first part of the notes that I was sharing, like what am I trying to do, this timeline. I pasted a lot of that in there to make real blogs that I could navigate to. Um, Dana Brown thinks I am a genius, so that's always good to read that. Um, so it's a real site. Um, it has the blog pages. It also has an actual test page. The test page is what I actually measured, which has a few widgets. Uh, and, you know, I, you can tell I'm not a web developer. Um, I'm sitting here trying to create a page, and as you people know, there are really no – good pictures of attractive females on the internet. So the best I could come up with is Wilford Brimley, but who wouldn't want to look at that face? So I put enough different sized images out here and sometimes I would um, try to condense them, compress them, sometimes I wouldn't. I have calendars, I have all kinds of stuff. So this, I feel like, you know, for the time that I had, this was sort of a realistic test. Um, this was going through Cloudflare for DNS. I, I turned on the DNS proxy and then I would turn it off to see what Lightspeed would do. I turned on and off the cache to see what it would do. I ran GT metrics against it as I as I added a couple of WordPress um, plugins to try to make things faster like a typical WordPress user would do. So I tried to make it realistic without trying to make it too fast, right? But Lightspeed in and of itself is a lot faster than an Apache um, right out of the box. It's, it, it's a really good web server, which is why they charge money for it, but it's it's great. Um, I'm going to leave this site up for probably another, you know, couple of weeks or 30 days unless somebody would like to sponsor the site and we'll keep it up. But it's it's there if you want to check it out. And the goal here, go back to presentation here. The goal here was to say, OK, create a regular WordPress site, make it work for one, then change it over and make H2 requests to that same site, basically turn Lightspeed into a h2 server right and then turn on the quick stuff and compare all three of those and check it with cloudflare without and then put those really bad wan profiles in there and see what happens is the head of line of blocking does it go away any idiot should be able to do this in about you know two hours right you set up a ubuntu server on aws you set up the rds server configure mysql get lightspeed working configure it with the latest php version get a wordpress theme install that set up your domain uh set up an email so that you can fire it off get an actual certificate because you can't use self-sign so get a ca certificate get set up with the cloudflare baseline everything with gt metrics and run a neoload test right so that's like what 30 minutes worth of work uh, unfortunately, it took me about 21 days to do this, and I, I basically had nobody to help me, so that's that's what happened. So here's what I came up with. On the left, you see version 1, which has a 4.6 second time, and 4.3 of those seconds is sitting there in an idle state. So your brain should be humming right now. Why is it taking so long in the idle state? Why is it waiting on something to do? And you look at the picture of the waterfall. Right. Then you move over to H2, which was a half a second. Right. And that waterfall looks a lot different. And it's only spending one hundred and nine milliseconds on idle time. Hmm, very interesting. But more time on rendering and more time on system. So it handles things differently. Then when you turn on quick, look at that waterfall. Look at how many requests are actually happening at the same time across that same connection. 
but it's two and a half seconds. The idle time is 1.5 seconds. So it's not as much as one, it's a lot more than two, and it spends a lot more time rendering and painting. So as where it ha have eight milliseconds and six milliseconds of rendering time on the other two, and this is the same browser, same machine, everything, just a different setting on the web server, I have 400 milliseconds on painting. So if your brain's not humming right now, it should be. Why would it look that way? Why does it seem that way? We're not gonna be able to answer all these questions today, but I've got two more minutes, I think. Henrik, if you'll give me these last few slides. These uh, metrics here are completely meaningless. So let's not, we're not gonna dive too deep into this. I just want you to know the top left is the CPU. The top right is the memory. The middle section is the time to first bytes, uh, minimum and maximum, or average and maximum. And the bottom one is average duration of the transaction time out of NeoLoad. And what I want you to look at is patterns here, right? So in this first one, the CPU, I'm ramping up the entire time about an hour to ramp up 50 users. So a very slow ramp up time so I can see the behavior. And then after an hour, I just start dumping users really quick. Notice on the right hand side what the memory does. I start out with that you know, 200,000 line there and I use up some memory, but then as I give the, the users back, I give the memory back, that's HTTP1. And the only time I get something weird is at the bottom, when I kill the users, I start seeing these really big spikes on the duration. And those of you who have done load testing before, you, you know what that's from, you've seen that pattern before, but they stayed fairly low and fairly consistent, so not really a huge deal. As we move to H2, about the same on the CPU, but notice the memory, not as much memory being used. And like uh, I would say, well, actually it was a little more memory, but it stayed very steady. But still, as I kill off the users on the end, you see at the bottom, I get this huge spike at the end and a few spikes throughout the duration of the test on the right, but mostly pretty low times, not a big deal, all right? Now, this is quick. We turn on quick. Notice the memory pattern on the top right how it's taking and giving memory during the test, even though I ramped it up exactly the same pattern. This is the same exact test running the same way every time. And I get the really big spikes of the timing at the very beginning of the test on the bottom left, and then it evens out and no spikes at the very end, and very few big spikes throughout the test. So the way Quick is handling these requests is obviously very different from protocols in the past. So what I did was I added a couple of really bad network emulation profiles. One was an LTE network with 50 milliseconds of latency. You can see the information there, but it's basically a kind of a regular LTE connection over a mobile device. And then the, the second one was a really bad satellite connection. And if you think this is over the top, I actually have a relative who lives on a farm who their only choice for internet is satellite and I did a speed test on them and this is actually better than what they get in terms of latency. So it is realistic. So let's turn it on for HTTP 1. Look at the memory profile. Look at the page times. Didn't get a huge spike at the very end like I did before on the LAN, but I got a little bit and a little throughout, but you know, basically two and a half second pages, which is about what we thought we were gonna get, um, about 15% CPU utilization. As we move to the satellite, the page times went up to about seven and a half to eight seconds piece, but notice the memory pattern again, okay? Just a little bit different. As we move to H2, memory is, slowly given back at, at the end over time. Uh, it's, a, it's a slow piece. And then these times were approximately one second uh, over LTE, and they went up to about five seconds as we went to the satellite. All right, still less CPU because the, the network connection is throttled. So I would expect to have a lot less CPU. And then with quick, here's LTE. So we had about a one second page time and notice that memory profile at the top right. Then we move to five seconds. So it went from uh, one second to five seconds. So five times the amount just because of the network connectivity. And I find that very interesting. I would have not have thought that it would have uh, been that great of a difference 
on the average duration, but it was. And that tells me that's probably that debug code that's running and it's probably providing that overhead and quick that eventually when they get done with draft, it will, it will be removed. So I know I went really fast over that. Um, I hope that I will maybe even present even more in a deeper level and I'll share all these details, but the summary is I think it probably does move those uh, headline blocking issues out of the way. Um, but there's going to have to be a lot of testing once that debug code uh, gets out of the way. And I think because of that, the CPU and memory for now is going to be a little more costly. Uh, you'll have to have more of it, but I think that will come down as well as they uh, tune this UDP uh, and quick transport protocol. I think the biggest benefit you're going to have is places where it's just really bad connections. That's where you're going to see the most um, bang for your buck. Uh, I think that any testing that you do needs to be with a network emulation tool like the Netropy product, and uh, that that should have been done with H2. We probably wouldn't have seen the lack of um, people you know, using it uh, when they hit that wall. And I can tell you this, right now they're only talking about HTTP as the protocol that uses Quick, but there are going to be more that come after that. So there's already talks in circles saying, what happens once we get this UDP and Quick thing working for the web? Uh, should we look at DNS servers next? Should we look at other types of protocols um, to utilize over UDP as well? Can we flip everything over to UDP eventually? I think you're probably going to see things move that direction. So, um, that's that's it. There are a lot of people that I'm recommending that you follow on Twitter if you want to keep up with what's going on with HTTP version 3. And there's a lot of references in these slides where you can go do your own research. And like I said, you should be able to recreate this experiment uh, exactly like I did and do the same level of testing. If you want to talk about it more, here's my information. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Henry. All right, Scott, awesome. And um, I, I looked at your your slides before uh, before your um, presentation. I mean, a few days ago. So I I, I, I know what, I looked at the slides deeply. Um, uh, so I'm not going to ask that. Uh, or did you use Grafana for the nice graph that you presented? Uh, I'm sorry. What did you say? Did I use what? <laughs> it was a joke. No, no, it was a joke. I was like, did you use Grafana for the nice graph that you presented? No, I used Neuroload. Oh, I didn't recognize. Oh. I'm, I'm an NASCAR driver today. I told you, I'm branded. <laughs> uh, no, it's a, a pretty awesome. What I, what, what I would be uh, interested uh, because here, I think you would. Uh, uh, I think from the moment uh, you have uh, uh, the proper example is going to be probably a data streaming, because that of request uh, and with the latency to. Yeah, how it goes. Because here it's going to be uh, uh, the user will blast the server, uh, and, uh, and the impact of latency will be quite huge. So it will be interesting to do the same exercise with a, let's say, a, a fake uh, demo, uh, uh, a, 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 a HLS or or, or MPEG dash app, and try to do the same bench. I'm pretty sure that's going to be quite awesome to, to see the results. I see that we have one. Have your friend connected, and he uh, he uh, and one of our friends, in fact, um, connected, and it's friends. Mr. Mr. James Pulley is here. It's a, it's a pleasure to have you on board, Mr. James. Dad, is that you? <laughs> <laughs> you did a great job. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so James uh, has uh, dropped a question during uh, oh, yes. your. Uh, your presentation, so I want to, uh, I, I will let uh, James ask it directly. I think it's better that you ask it. Uh, so Scott, uh, did you compare the system and application components of CPU to see how those were changing from HTTP 1.1 to 2 to, to 3? Well, the first thing I did was compare it to 1.1 without any encryption, because you can still do that, right? And obviously when you add the SSL, then we started seeing more CPU power. But honestly, between them all, it was for 50 virtual users against this small Ubuntu micro instance, I might add, 20% CPU or less. When you start adding 
really bad network connectivity, it was like 15% or less. So it doesn't, the CPU doesn't have to work as hard. I was really impressed at what that little micro instance could do. But also remember, I took the MySQL database and separated it out and put it into the RDS um, piece. So I at least had a two tier system and that, I think that helped. Okay, thank you. Uh, by the way, light speed is uh, a lot more uh, easier on the CPU. It handles it a lot better, and it's it's really a good web server, I have to say. So, so are, you, are you saying that you want to see the same results from the moment we got Apache supporting uh, the quick protocol? I didn't catch the last of it. I won't get the same results if what? If you we were utilizing Apache. Correct. Absolutely. I believe that with Apache, you're going to see a lot more CPU and you will not be able to sustain as many requests if you tried to stress that server. Uh, Apache just, it isn't there and it's it's free and that's what you get. But Lightspeed is basically putting a lot more effort into their their engine that runs behind it and it's, it's very fast and they have a lot of uh, additional things like caching that they do a lot better out of, out of the box. So that's that's where they're charging for basically. Uh, Mr. Alexander Pudelko, you first of all, yeah, I see that you're wearing a very fancy, nice jacket with a nice team. Awesome, thank you. Uh, for that. Thank you. <laughs> uh, you have any so questions for Scott? Yes, I have. So, uh, how actually Neolot is working with uh, that protocol? So, what you actually put in it? That's what did I question? What did I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just having trouble hearing right now. Yeah, I, I am asking um, how you create load with Neo load actually. With, so Neo load because that different. is diff, different protocol actually, how you handle well, it. Neo, it's still HTTP and what it is, it's HTTP2 and it's running over quick. So. In Chrome, there is a flag that you can enable or disable, right? So you can totally disable H2 and force it, even if the web server supports it, you can force it to go 1.1. Then you turn the flag on and, and force it to be H2 and you have the web server going H2. Then what you have to do is take light speed and turn on the quick options and make H2 go over quick pointing to UDP. So you have to open up the uh, UDP port 443, uh, I had to do that on Amazon at, at the web server level, and I also have to turn that on on Lightspeed, and then you begin seeing that traffic, because Lightspeed would support up to draft 29 at the time, and I got, I looked at the network tab in Chrome DevTools, and I would actually see Q229, so, I, I'm sorry, H2Q29, so I was well, I able to actually look at it with a browser. So I, I understand that you yeah. how it works between Chrome and Lightspeed, but how Neoload get into that picture because so it doesn't. To, to, so to answer the question, Alexander, so Neoload is currently not supporting officially uh, HTTP three and Quick Protocol. The way uh, to generate load, you have to uh, to use a solution like Puppeteer uh, with Chromium. Uh, so you drive uh, another, so neither browser-based that supports the technology. There's the protocol-based approach at the moment. We we are still looking at it to be improved. It's still a, a draft. We don't have an official version. Yeah. You're supposed to say it was a super secret thing you can't share yet until the next version. Sorry. I mean, nobody is. I mean, it, it's 10 10:30 uh, p.m. in Europe, so pretty sure that uh, no 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 European will listen to that. So. <laughs> they stay. Oh. Sorry, uh, we we don't see here you are staying. Your mic is uh, disconnected. Uh, yeah, it's it's when you're drinking and uh, talking it doesn't work together. <laughs> <laughs> no, is it's, it a triple it's, Do you know it? Ah, it's a developer. Okay. Yeah, coming from Belgium, I need to make a bit of publicity here. 
But yeah, it's, 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 good, it's good television live. It's awesome. And being part of it is even better. So well done, Scott. And uh, uh, good you. to see you again, Alex. Uh, but I only joined the last bit. So for me, this is all new what you talked about. So we'll have to listen to the recording, but it uh, did look exciting. Well, it's one of those things where um, I, I was a little bit behind on H2 and I wanted to get ahead of the curve. And now I'm kind of too ahead of the curve, right? So I, I missed the wave on the other side. So now I got to kind of wait on all the tools to kind of catch up so that you can then do it. And they, they got to finalize the code too, right? Because there's bugs at that low level, just like there are at other levels of products as well. So they still got to wait to go. It's always good to serve the ways. Huh? The ways some sometimes go with, and someone sometimes backwards, and learn a bit of swimming as well, and and we'll be all good. That's right. Absolutely. Uh, thanks everybody for for having me here, and Henrik, thanks for putting this on. This is actually, I agree, this is a great uh, medium here to do this, and it looks great and it sounds great. Thank you, Scott. I really appreciate it. So um, I have no question from my side, Scott uh, or Alexander. Do you have any any uh, questions for Scott? No. Okay. So uh, thank you, Scott. I was uh, an, an, an amazing, uh, a pretty uh, great session, and uh, I'm uh, I'm looking forward to see if we can keep your server up and make some other tests. That would be pretty awesome. Sounds good. Uh, so. So if you have any, uh, if you can send your, uh, uh, like uh, Zach called uh, for us last year, if you have your wallet address in, uh, in Bitcoin, you can send some Bitcoin address to Scott more directly. So it's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But no, I, so, I yeah, find I it off on the computers since we've been talking to almost pay for it, so. No worries. All right, so uh, let's make a, a short break. Uh, so we will have uh, in nine minutes, uh, we will start uh, Alexander's uh, session, which will close the uh, fourth stop US East. So stay tuned, let's make a small break, and we're coming back after with Alexander. Thank you. 